Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to be with you one more time. We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 19 tonight. I, I invite you to open your Bibles and make your way there, whether if in a hard text or a phone or a tablet. However, you're getting the Word of God tonight, you need to be in 1 Kings chapter 19, and we'll be looking at that text here in just a moment. I'm really so thankful for you and for allowing me to spend these past few days together. I hope the week didn't drag on. I hope in many ways it flew right on by as these tend to do. And I'll just say it's just been an immense blessing to be with you. I love this church and I love you for so many different reasons. I love your shepherds and to each of you, thank you so very much for giving me the privilege of being with you. It, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you every chance that we get. So thank you so much for that wonderful opportunity. Uh, to all of you who took such good care of me and your kind hospitality and made sure that my slim fits don't fit as well before I came, thank you so much. I've been treated like a king here this week, and I'm leaving with my cup overflowing, not just with food, but your kindness and encouragement has gone such a long way. And I, I believe I'm leaving far more blessed than you are out of this arrangement, so thank you so very much. I love you for loving my family. I have a lot of family intermingled uh, with each of you here, but specifically Sarah and Jared and Joel and Katie and the girls and the boys. Uh, I love how much you love them, and I know that they love you, and that means the world to me. And so thank you for welcoming them among you, and I just love spending time with them. I don't have young boys anymore, and so the wrestling matches I had today, I, mean, I got a kink in my back. I got to go home with and get that out. I'll tell you, the real hero out of all of these, these kind of, of opportunities, I love every chance God so graciously opens doors for the gospel to be spread and for me to be able to go. Uh, but I've got a hero back home. My wife, who takes care of the three kids, for all the stretch of me being gone is, is just a blessing. I would covet your prayers for her and the boys. I'm not going home tomorrow. Lord willing, Joel and I are going to be traveling to Kansas City as long as well as Sarah and Jared. There's a funeral on Friday of, of a hero of ours, and we're going to go and attend that funeral, and then I'll be home, Lord willing, at the end of the week. So if you pray for my wife and for our kids, I would certainly appreciate that. And I'll be praying for you. I believe this, and I hope you believe this too. Great things have happened in your past. I, I've been able to see it firsthand. I've been here, a part of it, and, and I've seen good things here. I really believe your best days are yet to come, and I hope you believe that. So much great opportunity of growth for you, for this church, for the work here in Fishers is ahead of you. And this new evangelist and the new people coming in are just but a foretaste of wonderful things yet to come. I'm excited for you and will be prayerful for you. Thank you. Thank you so much for just blessing me with a wonderful week. And thank you, Brother Al. You took us to the throne of God, and we're ready tonight. We're ready, brother, to ring out that message. We've been talking about Fixer Upper and how God is involved in a work in every one of our lives. It's a, it's a work of renovation. That he's taking every one of us in our hearts and he's taking out those things that are, are old and broken and don't belong. And he's making them more like Jesus. 1 John 3 and verse 8 says that he came to destroy the works of the evil one. And that's what he is doing. He's taking down those old habits. He's taking away those broken thoughts. He's taking around those tainted hearts. And he's leaving more of his image in our life. And that ought to be our prayer. The more time he gives me on this precious earth, let it be more time that I become more and more like him. But we're going to end tonight with this concept of replacing isolation with family. We're going to get to 1 John, but I want to start away from there in a completely different context. I did call an audible. I just... I got thinking too much, and so I want to go a different way. We're not going to be here till midnight. I would love to test that with how kind you are and to see <laughs> how long it would take before Al stormed the stage and Jan cut the trap door. We're, we're not going to do that. I just I have a few thoughts. I want to go in a different direction with the note cards we're taking you. I did some work earlier this, this year on a, on a concept I think fits so well with this study. Loneliness, I believe in many ways, is one of the greatest weapons of the evil one. Feeling isolated and alone. And so I, I did some work with some teens. And, I, and I'll show you some of what I presented earlier this year with you about loneliness and teenagers. But as I was working on that and doing research, I thought, you know, what is, what is a good way to illustrate loneliness today? Or what would that look like? And then... The internet provided everything that I needed to just give a beautiful glimpse of loneliness. Can you sing that song there in your head? None of the teenagers knew it. All by myself. That's a good picture of loneliness. 
there's this meme going around of SpongeBob all by himself. And what's funny about this picture, this became an overnight sensation and people ravaged the internet to provide real life pictures of what this looks like. Restaurants and certain seating arrangements that just make it clear you are by yourself. Like, look at that. That seat is intended to say you are not dating anyone or with anyone. <laughs> well, I love this one. Isn't the scenery great? <laughs> How's the blue today? Yeah. I think my favorite one, it was two years ago, the, the, the Lakers were heading back to the bench after a play, and he's going up for a high five. When you got to give yourself a high five, I mean, that is like the epitome of loneliness. I don't even know who that is, but I just, I could watch that all night. I love that. That's lonely. Now, let me, can I put this here? All right. Let me transition to this for a moment because we can laugh at certain things about loneliness, but loneliness is, is serious. And I don't mean, I don't mean in any sense to trivialize what many of us know and have felt in many ways. And that is, it's hard to be alone. It's hard to feel alone. It's hard to feel as if no one's really there for me and understands where I am at. There's a lot of studies showing that our younger generations, our teenagers, our early college, are feeling an, an heightened sense of just loneliness. And what many people are attributing it to, I'll put the articles up here, is the fact that our smart devices, which make us connected more than any other time before, are actually making us less connected. We have an immense opportunity to, to connect with social media, but it's resulting in people who just don't know how to socialize. People who just feel separated. And that's not unique to young people. 36% of this one poll reported the feeling lonely frequently or almost all the time. 61% of those who are 18 to 25 reported, uh, reported heightened levels of loneliness. And then many young people who reported serious loneliness also said they felt as if no one genuinely cared about them and no one was listening. And all of this came to a grand conclusion after 2020, in the year which we literally were separated from one another. And this quote I read, I thought said it best, one out of every four of us is walking around with no one to share our lives with. Now you think about that. One out of four of us, and you look in a congregation in this, of this size, one out of four, you're talking two to three people in every pew go home and they don't have anyone that they share anything about their life with. They're walking around completely alone. What I like about 1 Kings 19 is that God opens a picture about someone who was alone, that he knew what it was like. It seems strange to us, because in 1 Kings 18, the man who will feel alone is literally on top of a mountain. It's Elijah. And Elijah is on top of Mount Carmel and he's praying to God. And God is casting down fires and he's defeating the prophets. He is literally a hero of God's people. That great triumph of 1 Kings 18 is met in 1 Kings 19 and verse 1, which says, Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, may the, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. Notice verse 3. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. He went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It's enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am not better than my father's. Did you notice that phrase in verse 3? Ran for his life. In one moment, you see such incredible courage as he's standing up to over 400 prophets of Baal and holding fast. There is one God and he is the one who is alive. But then here when this wicked queen sends her threats, he buckles. He literally cripples under her message and he runs. And verse 3, not only does he run, but he isolates himself. He leaves his servant and anyone who would know him, and by himself he runs. 
He spends time under this tree. And then in verse 8, he eats and drinks and goes 40 days and 40 nights. A 40-day journey by foot to the mountain of God. Verse 9 of our context. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord. A God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. What will follow is he stands on the mountain of the Lord, and the Lord tells him, come out and I will speak to you. And then great things happen. There's a mighty wind, there's an earthquake, and there's a fire, and God's not in any of those but in this calm, gentle breeze, God speaks to this discouraged prophet. And again, he asks in verse 13, what, what are you doing here, Elijah? And in verse 14, he repeats, I, I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. We're not really given the emotional context of what led him to feel this way. Maybe it was exhaustion because he had, had literally run down the mountain home. King Ahab had a nice chariot and he outran the chariot. It's a good lesson about old and in shape. He's emotionally exhausted. He's physically exhausted, and he gets to this point where even the words of a worthless woman, and that's what she was, a worthless pagan woman, completely dismantles that faith he once had. And twice he says to God, I, I've been so good to you. I, I, I've stood up for you. I've preached the word for you. Your people forsook you. I, I didn't. I've been serving you. And now I'm all that's left. I'm the only one. Who's faithful to you? I'm all alone. Can you sympathize with that? Have you ever had times, maybe at work, when in the environment of those around you, you think, man, I, I am the only one who cares about God, who has any sense of integrity or morals about them and the people I'm around. I'm the only one at school who's willing to use the name of Jesus in a right way, in an honoring way. I'm the only one in my family, sometimes we might say, I'm the only one in this church who really cares about Jesus and about doing what is right and what is good. You know what I believe? That's exactly what Satan wanted him to believe. And that's exactly what Satan wants you and I to believe too. I'm the only one and no one else is there willing to stand up for what is right. I don't remember which one it is. My youngest daughter, who's four years old, is in love with Harry Potter. And so we went through the movies. And in one of those 100 movies, there's this one scene where Harry is talking with this girl and talking about the enemy they were facing. And she says to him, if I were you-know-who, the great villain, she said, I'd want you to feel cut off from everyone else. Because if it's just you alone, you're not as much of a threat. Can't you think about that? Don't you think Satan wants us to feel that way? No one else. No one else cares. No one else is doing what's right. No one else outside of these walls is trying to serve the Lord and further his kingdom and ring out that message. I'm the only one. What's God's answer and his response? I think there's a few things right out of here that will lead us to some thoughts we need to, to, to land at tonight. Let's start here. In times of loneliness and those times when we feel all alone, let's maybe appreciate the fact that there is good that can come out of this. That may seem counterintuitive to the, the title we're looking at and the subject of, of our lesson tonight, but there is good about our lonely, quiet moments. You go back a little earlier in 1 Kings 19, that when he runs to that tree in verse 4 and he's laying it all on the Lord. I'm alone left. I'm done, Lord. Take my life. It's over. Do you notice how God responded in verse 5? And the Lord said, okay, and stepped on him and ended his life. <laughs> no, it says that he lay down and he slept under a juniper tree and behold, there was an angel touching him and he said to him, arise, eat. And then he looked and behold, and there at his head was a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him in verse 7. He said, Arise and eat because the, Lord, because the journey for you is too great. 
How did God respond to this weary, depressed, angry, and angsty prophet? Why don't you take a nap, Elijah? Are you hungry? I got some bread for you. Are you, you thirsty? I just got this water for you. Why don't you lay down for a little bit? Why don't you eat this food? Why don't you rest? We don't like it, but more times than not, the times when we are absolutely alone and there's no one with us can be very good for us. Have you ever had that before? Have you ever had those moments purposefully like Jesus when you go to places that are lonely and there is no one there? No people, no traffic, no billboards, maybe a place with no cell service, no internet connection, and you just unplug from the world. The bad thing is you and I are so conditioned right now to run, 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 run. And any dull space in our life, we plug it and we fill it with something. With our kids, it's activities. I'm guilty of it too. Because if they're not going to do cello and tennis and sports and swimming and school and scholastics, I mean, I, I kind of want them to get a taste of everything. And so we plug it all in. What that happens then is that we end up a lot like Elijah where we just get so run down, so weary that we lose sight of things we know that are true. That God is always there and I'm not alone and I can keep on going strong, but I, I lose sight of that because I'm just so tired and what God gave him was a moment to rest and there's a beauty in that I don't know what your mountain would be I realize literally there's no mountains in Indiana get the metaphorical idea though do you have a place and a time can you remember the last time when there was nothing and I mean nothing. I don't mean the background music like at Starbucks. I don't mean a show playing in the background that you're not really watching. I mean nothing. For some of us, this terrifies us. Because if you sit still long enough with nothing but silence, you're forced to think about things we don't like to think about. It's just me and God. I wonder what God thinks of me. I wonder how I'm doing with him. And in this moment where I literally have nothing distracting me from the Almighty, it's either a moment that we try and fill with noise and with sound, or it's a beautiful moment when free from the distractions of the world, we just get to commune with our God. I don't know what it would look like for you, but I will suggest it. We need far often those more moments of where we can get away and rest and rest. Disney's not it. Time with your wife watching a movie isn't it. I mean nothing but just us and God. And Elijah needed that. And I think we need it more too. I think you also need to realize the reality that he needed to come out of the cave. God gave him time. He gave him opportunity. He let him run. He let him rest. But that wasn't going to be the end of the story. Because if you go a little further down in chapter 19, it says in verse 15, The Lord said to Elijah, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazel king over Aram, and Jehu the son of Nemeshi, you shall anoint as, as king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel-Melola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. He says, Elijah, I've given you a chance to get some rest, to catch your breath, to get a good meal. But you can't stay here. You can't stay in the cave. You can't lodge here. You still got work to do. You've got people you've got to connect with. You've got a mission you need to fulfill. So get your rest, catch your breath, but then you've got to get back to work. There's something God knew about Elijah, and there's something that God knows about us that's clear here, and that is we are not made to be isolated people, people who live on an island. Even from the very beginning, the one thing that God said was not good out of all that was made was that man was alone. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And while the context is about marriage, I think you and I get that. We're not better alone. We're not stronger by ourselves. We are beings who are created to be together. In other words, we are people who need people. We are people who belong by God's design. 
But let me put in a warning here because we, we tasted a bit of this in the past year. It's really easy to, to fall into some substitutes for connectivity that just are not the same thing. I can give you a taste of this. We need fellowship. We need connection. We need that closeness with one another. I'll tell you, I have a lady who is in my office 24-7. And she listens to me every time I talk to her. Sometimes I have to repeat myself, but she listens. And whatever I ask her to do, she can do it in multiple languages and in multiple dialects. I have Alexa, this is, a, if you don't know, it's Alexa Dist. Maybe I didn't make that clear. <laughs> I can talk with her and she can talk back to me. I can ask her for a joke and she will tell me a joke. I can sing with her. I can have her to play some hymns and I can sing with her. But I'm plugged from the wall. I'm plugged from electricity. This is just a plastic, di plastic disc. It's not a person. And I tell you, I've been through some storms this year. I've been to the hospital with my little princess this year. And I didn't think about the plastic disc. I did think about my brethren who are reaching out to me. This is not the same, is it? Connecting through a screen is, is not the same, is it? A year ago, our grandfather passed away. He's been on the other side with the Lord for over a year now. And I brought with me something I keep in my office. I have a letter he wrote to me when I first started preaching. And so I see his handwriting. It used to, and I haven't really tested it in a while, it used to have his smell. And I know that may sound a little strange, but if you've lost a loved one, you understand that every, every bit of their trace is still with you in many ways. And so in my office, I have a picture of he and my father and me and Benjamin are four generations, and I have this letter. And in many ways, when I read it, I can still smell him, and I can hear his voice. But this is not like having him here. This is not the same as having him in person. Because I also have this. Emma made me promise I would bring this with me. In fact, I couldn't leave before she finished drawing this picture of the rainbow, a beautiful picture of heaven. And this is precious, and I see her handiwork all over this thing, but my baby girl's not with me right now. Screens, texting, Facebook messaging, boy, they're convenient and they're nice. Even live streaming can be convenient in moments. It is not the same as being together. And we now more than ever need to be called out of our caves into relationships with one another where we see one another and listen to one another and care for one another. But you know what this takes? Do you know what it takes to come out of the cave? It takes an immense amount of courage. Have you seen the movie Encanto? We don't talk about Bruno. Can we talk about Bruno for just a minute? You know what I loved about this? I don't, it, you might not have seen the movie. I'm going to spoil it for you for just a moment. There's this man named Bruno who has a lot of baggage and a lot of bad things said about him that's just misunderstood. And we find out that he's been hiding within the walls of his own home. And when you see where he is, you realize when you find his living quarters, that heart wrenching scene where right behind the dining table, he has drawn his own plate. What he wanted more than anything was to be with his family but he hid behind those walls. Do you know what it took for Bruno to have that relationship with his family? He couldn't stay in his cave. He could not stay behind those walls. It took breaking down the house. <laughs> it took a curse and a lot of other hour long things that would explain the movie, but eventually he had to leave the walls and step out and courage to see whether or not his family would accept him. And of course they did with open arms. Maybe it's been a long time since I've reached out to my brethren or to my family or to another person face to face. But if we want that healing from that feeling of isolation, brethren, we can't hide in our caves any longer. Please, please, please. 2020 was just a band-aid. It was never meant to be a, a, a permanent fix. We cannot live isolated on our devices. We have to be a people who live together. Come out from our caves and belong. 
I love one person said, if we share our story with someone who responds with empathy and understanding, shame can't survive. I love that idea. We have to be willing to be brave and honest and to share the intimate parts of ourselves, and that's where real love and connection will thrive. And I'll say one more thing about Elijah, is that there was a need for us in our lonely moments to confront the lives, because two times, in verse 10 and verse 14, Elijah says to God, I'm the only one left. No one else in all of Israel is willing to be faithful to you. In fact, all of your people have left you. I'm the only one in this entire nation who's standing up for you. And God let him say it two times. He let him express his heart two times. But then after those two times, he says in verse 18, I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Seven thousand. Elijah didn't know about them. Elijah didn't even know they existed. But God knew them. And he knew them by name. Do you know what happens in our moments of loneliness? And maybe we need to be reminded of it from this context. Oftentimes what I feel is not what is real. I may feel like I am the only one who is standing up for God, but that's not what's real. I may feel like I'm the only one who's working outside these walls. No one else is active, but that's not real. There's probably a lot to this story like Elijah that I just don't know, that I don't see, that I don't understand, but God does. And instead of believing the lie that Satan wants us to believe, let's catch that tonight. Satan wants us to believe you're all alone and there is no one, no one who stands up like you do. No one who is as faithful as you are. You are all alone in your journey and you've got to do the best you can on your own to make it to heaven. And that's not at all the reality, brethren. Let's come back and let's finish right here. 1 John 3, our fix, fixer upper passage. Jesus came to replace isolation with family. In many ways, this greater context has a lot to do with just me and you and what we do, how I need to replace corruption with purity in my heart, how I need to be the one who chases away my doubt and build my faith stronger. It's a lot about me and my walk. But did you notice all the we and us and connective tissue words and just the first few verses. Can you trace it with me? See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be just like him because we shall see him just as he is. Do you see it? Do you see us in this passage? Do you see what he shows us? Every time Satan wants me to believe, wants you to believe I'm all alone in this. By myself, no one understands, no one knows, no one else is trying. Let's come back and let's confront those lies with truth. You see what we see right here? We're family in verse 1. He says, we are children of God. He said it in verse 1 and in verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. In verse 1 he says, such we are. We are called the children of God. We're family. There's something special about family. I gotta be really careful because I got family right here in the pew and I've got 30 years locked and loaded to be able to share with you, but <laughs> you know about family, don't you? No one loves like family loves. Can we say that again? No one loves like family loves. We fight for our family. We stand up for our family. Sometimes we battle with family, but you know the reasons we battle so hard with our family? It's because we love so greatly with our family. The greater the battles are just the evidence of the greatness of the love that exists therein. And yes, we hurt in our families, but we never give up on our family. We never give up. So when someone struggles and someone falls and someone disappoints, we never give up. We never turn our back on our family. And that's true of blood, but brethren, it is even true in the family of God. We are family. We're in this together. We love one another. We've been united in the same faith in Christ Jesus. We are one. We are brothers and sisters of the same Father. We're one. 
He also says that we are in this together. He says that the world does not know us, and it does not know us. Because we do things that are just strange, following the footprints of Jesus. Who loves their neighbor without really even knowing their neighbor, not knowing them intimately, not knowing that they're going to love them in response? Who loves their enemy as themselves? And that's us. Now, can I take us outside of here for just a moment? Will you go with me to Romans chapter 12 in your Bibles? Romans 12. We are in this together. And that means a lot of different things. That reminds us from what he says here that the world does not know us. The us that reminds us that you and I have started something on the same path, in the same way, with the same intention. Here's what that means. We believe in the same God tonight. Jesus, the Son of God. We believe in him. We believe in the Bible and we believe in the resurrection. Everyone here who is part of this family has obeyed the gospel, has made Jesus their Lord and been baptized. Praise God. Everyone here who is part of that family, we've done that. We've done that. And even though we're different, we think differently, we act differently, we have different preferences, different ways of dressing, different ways of speaking, the reality is we are all trying to reach that final goal, which means even though we're different, we're trying to follow King Jesus. We're trying the best we can outside these walls to please King Jesus. We're trying to raise our families to follow King Jesus. We're trying to make our marriages work and to thrive. We're trying to raise our children to honor the King. We are all striving towards that same goal. The problem is, more often than not, Satan confuses our differences as a reason to divide. Reasons for us to pull apart. Romans chapter 12 Paul would say in verse 3, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Mm. That's the rub. That's the hard thing, is that we're different. He uses this analogy of a body. You ever thought that through before? The analogy he uses that this special fellowship here is a lot like a human body. With eyes and nose and teeth and ears. And those are the things we talk about. You have a really nice smile. You have beautiful eyes. I like your hair. Or I'm praying for you because you lost your hair. However that's, that's worded. When, but when was the last time anyone came to you and said, you know, your kidneys look great. Your toes are beautiful. That's kind of creepy. <laughs> when was the last time someone praised you on the health of your gallbladder? When was the last time someone asked you, how's your spleen doing, aside from your doctor? But do you see the analogy? I kind of like my spleen, don't you? I kind of miss my gallbladder. Life would be hard without toes and fingers. Some parts of the body are, are seen more than others and praised more than others and noticed more than others. But we wouldn't be who we would be without every single part. Our diversity is not a cause for division, brethren. Our diversity is by God's design. We are better together. And we are better, unique, specially created by God. Were we all one same person, we could not do all the things that we are able to do. We could not think in this beautiful blend of a harmony of thoughts and experiences and talents to pull something so, so unique, so distinctive, and yet it flows and weaves together in almost, almost heavenly perfection to have something that works so well. And that's us. Let's get over that. You can't do what someone else can do. That's all right. God made you you. You can't preach. You can't song lead. But maybe there are some things you can do that those who preach and song lead cannot do. Maybe you can work with your hands. Maybe you're really good at encouraging. Don't sit on the sidelines because you can't do what, else, what someone else can do. Just be you. Just be you to the best that you can be you and glorify God in that. We need us to be us in all of our differences. There's a story about this, about this famous pianist, Ignace Perdewiski. That's how I say it down in Dallas. I know that's not at all probably how you pronounce his name. He came into town, 
And this mother had this three-year-old piano prodigy. I think every parent thinks their kid is a prodigy. She was convinced he's a prodigy. So she took him to the concert and was sitting there in the front row waiting for this famous pianist to come on the stage. Well, she was there with some friends and was talking with her friends. And then the lights came on because someone was on the stage. And so she turned around to get her son ready and realized he was not there. He was up on the stage. And before she could get to him to get those motherly talons and stop him, he started playing on the piano and playing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Well, out came the pianist. And instead of scolding the boy or making a joke out of it, he simply came to him and reached around him. And while he continued to play, he reached down and said, don't stop playing. And he began to weave in chords and arpeggios, beautiful dissonances, and turned that simple song into a masterpiece. I guarantee if you felt it like I have, there are times when I look up at God and say, all I've got is twinkle, twinkle, little star. The kingdom is filled with such immense, immensely talented people. But I guarantee God says to you like he says to me, just don't stop playing. And God takes our simple, humble efforts as they are. And when joined together with one another in his amazing grace, brethren, he's making a masterpiece out of the work that we're doing. I know we're different. I know we are. But brethren, that's by God's design. We are one. We are the body of Christ. We are the citizens of heaven. We are the redeemed saints, the children of God. And as John would say, we, we are heaven bound. Did you notice when he says when he appears? There are times when at the end of this verse, I've imagined it in the language of I. When he appears, I shall be like him because I shall see him just as he is. And I've imagined that. I, I've gone in my mind and tried to get what that would be like. I kind of wonder, is it going to be like, do you remember in that movie, The Beauty and the Beast, when the, the beast dies and then he kind of is taken up and is sparkly and he turns into the print? Is that what it's going to be like when I'm transformed into the image? I don't know. But boy, I'm really excited. More than excited. It's my heart's longing and desire to see him and to be like he is. But this takes on a far richer application when I take out the I from this passage and I leave it the way it was written, we, we. Because we all know some who have lived their life shackled with sickness and illness, diseases and handicaps, and one day they will be no more. There's a sweet boy named Seth back in Dallas who has never known what it is like to hear his mother's voice or to see with clear vision. And Seth will see and hear perfectly when Jesus comes. There have been some who have only lived their life in a wheelchair. They have never had the strength to walk and they will walk side by side with King Jesus one day. And most of our loved ones, when we say goodbye to them, it's not in their strength. We see them so frail and so weakened, not who they used to be, but that is not how we will see them again. We will see them in their beauty and in their glory in a way we have never seen them before when we see them with Jesus. 2019 in Dallas was really hard for us. It was hard. Because in January of 2011, or I'm sorry, 20, uh, 2019, Clay Chapman, who was only 11 years old, on Sunday got, got home from services and got sick. Just got sick at the, on the floor. He vomited on the floor. Mom took care of him. And by midweek, he was looking great. Things were fine. And then Friday the same week, he passed away. Unannounced, unexpected, by a rare genetic disease that no one, no one had even heard of. And that shook us for a while. 
shook us as a church family. Of course we rejoice. We rejoice knowing where he is. But something so sudden to someone so young, it hurt our church family. But I want to share with you something that came out of it. With my boys, Emma wasn't home yet. I had practiced something at home with them before, before they would go to sleep, especially Benjamin. My, my son, Noah, was a bit too young. I'd ask Benjamin three questions as we would end our time in the Bible together. I'd say, who are you? Where are you going? And how are you going to get there? And oftentimes I'd say, who are you? He said, I'm Benjamin, son of Appa. <laughs> yes, you are. That's Appa's daddy in Korean. And I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to heaven. And I'd say, how are you going to get there? And he'd say, by listening to Jesus, by following the Bible, by trusting in him. Words like that, which made us so proud. But after Clay passed, it was different. I said, who are you? He said, I'm Benjamin, your son. I said, well, Benjamin, where are you going? He said, I'm going to heaven. I said, and how are you going to get there? And he held my hand and said, together. We're going to get there together. And that hurt. I needed that. Because I held his little hand and I said, buddy, we know that Clay went ahead of us, don't we? And it may be that Jesus will come and we're going to go home side by side. But it could be by God's good plan that either you and I go first. One might go ahead of the other. And I want you to know if your daddy goes first, you just keep being faithful and you just keep being true. And I promise I'll be waiting for you there. I can't imagine, I can't imagine heaven without my wife and my boys and my girl. But brethren, I can't imagine heaven without you. We are the family of the redeemed. And these beautiful evenings of us, whether we realize it or not, are just a sweet taste of what is to come. Do you realize that? We are going to dwell before the throne of God one day. We are going to live together in heaven one day. One day. Please don't stop. Please don't. You're doing such good work. You are honoring God, and you are learning, and you are growing. You parents are doing such tremendous work with your children. You have so much to be proud of. Just finish that job. You just keep being strong. Keep praying and keep studying. Keep on trying, brethren. All too soon, we'll be there before the throne of God, side by side. If you have not started this journey, tonight is your night. Tonight is your night to do so. Tonight is the night to put away the sin, to put on Christ in baptism, to accept that free fountain of his forgiveness, and to be a child of God. Before my family, I long to stand in paradise with you. I'll leave you with these words, my favorite words from one of my favorite hymns. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting and serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will all the toils of life repay. Brethren, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that'll be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and we will shout. Let's live heaven bound. We can help you in any way tonight. Let's do it right now. Let's do it as we stand and as we sing.